So the assumptions, you're talking about the distribution of errors being normally, independently, and identically distributed, or what we would say NIID, right? Normal, independent, identically distributed um, with mean of zero and some variance standard deviation. So these assumptions we're not going to spend too much time on. We've talked about looking at normality. Independence obviously is critical as far as, well, what type of test do we use? If, if it's not independent, you got to use a related test. Obviously, you expect independence between groups for an independent sample test. You don't expect independence between times or groups in a related test, but you do expect independence of the different scores. Um, and this doesn't apply much with um, a one sample other than the scores within the sample, just like the different scores here should be independent. Uh, with identicality, identicality only applies when you have multiple variances, so really it matters most in the independent sample case. And what you're doing is you want to look to see whether or not the variability of the groups are approximately equal. Normally we use a difference of a factor of three or four. So if you had one group that had a standard, deep, uh, well, you use variance. One group has a variance of 10 and another group has a variance of 100. Well, that is a 10 fold increase, right? That's a 10 time difference. That's a very big difference. If you have one group that has a standard deviation or variance, excuse me, of 10 and another one has a variance of 15, that's not a huge difference. Uh, so a lot of times a factor of three or four, right? If one's three times bigger than the other, you probably should, you know, be a little concerned about that. You can also use Levine's F-test, which tests whether or not the variances are equal. Um, this is reported in the output that we'll look at. It doesn't always perform that well, but it is another thing you can look at for evidence. If you get a significant result for Levine's F, it means that you have a heterogeneity of variance. That is, the two groups have different variances, statistically speaking. And if that happens, uh, you could use the robust version of the t-test that does not assume a quality of variance. So there is still a solution you can do. Um, so we'll look at some of the applications, but GraphPad has t-test calculators where you can put in the data and it'll compute it for you in addition to the fact that you can convert T and P values. Excel, under the data analysis, has t-test options. And as yes. of course. Um, when you think about what changes um, how big a T result is, obviously there are three major things. The numerator contains the difference between the observed and expected values. So if the difference between those values is larger, the value of T will increase. The variance is in the denominator of the test. If the variance increases, what happens? The size of t gets smaller, right? If the sample size increases, because it is a denominator in the denominator, it would make your denominator, if this goes up, the denominator shrinks on the whole. So what happens is your t value goes up. So larger sample sizes lead to larger t values, larger differences lead to larger t values, larger variances lead to smaller t values, all else being held constant, right? So these things all impact T, which means that statistical significance is not just about how big the difference is. It is about how many, how much evidence you have, i.e. the sample size. It's about how variable the scores are, and it is about the size of the difference. If you're trying to just look at size of difference, effect sizes are commonly used, such as the R or Cohen's D. R squared equation here, t squared over t squared plus df. Again, be sure to solve each of those terms independently before doing the final division. And Cohen's d here is basically the t-test except for you don't use square root n in the denominator. So the effect sizes that we use here, let's do some examples. So earlier we had a case where we were looking at students on an SAT for a one sample case with an average SAT for the class, 1120, standard deviation of 25, sample size of 25, and an expected value of 1050. So we calculated the T value already. If we were to look at Cohen's D, Cohen's D is simply going to be like the T test, except for it's not going to have a standard error. 
it's just going to have a standard deviation in the denominator. So we would have the observed minus the expected over 25. So you're going to have 70 over 25. Right, so there's no square root n. That's the only thing that changed about this equation. Everything else in this equation is identical to the t-test. So if you have 70 divided by 25, you get a Cohen's d of 2.8. So this would be a very large difference. Now, if we were going to do r squared, we would take our t squared value and our degrees of freedom value. So if you remember when we did our test, or the t-test, 1120 minus 1050 over 25 divided by the square root of 25, and we got 14. So this is Cohen's d. This is t. And r squared here is always going to be between 0 and 1. And it is going to be 14 squared, that's t squared, over 14 squared plus 24, because that is our degree of freedom term. So if we do that, what we're going to get is 196 over 196 plus 24. So 196 over 220 is 0.89 rounded to two decimal places. So that is, again, a very large effect. So what we're finding here is that these students are doing substantially better. Uh, this teacher's class is doing much better, uh, whether we talk about significance or here practical significance. Effect sizes are often called basically Statistical tests tell you, is the difference likely real, or is it maybe due to chance? If something's significant, we conclude the effect is real. Effect sizes tell you, how big is it? Now, there's not like rules. It's kind of like Pirates of the Caribbean, right? It's more like guidelines. So some of the guidelines for determining the size of the effect, you're, everyone has slightly different rules. Cohen's D is really standardized because Jacob Cohen, who developed Cohen's D, um, published his own, and so everyone uses his. But R squared isn't quite as consistent. I think your book gives slightly different values than I've given here, but both sets are common. Um, so 0 0.01 is considered a small effect. That means that only 1% of the variance is explained. 0 0.05, the medium, and 0.15, large. But some people use 0 0.01, 0 0.09 ish, 0 0.1 ish, and something like 0.25. So not everyone agrees, but again, they're kind of guidelines. I'm, I'm not really that concerned with you memorizing whether it's a small, medium, or large effect precisely. I'm much more concerned with you understanding that these numbers increasing mean that there is a greater effect, and that there are some thresholds that people use to try to make sense of that effect. But it should always be hedged in the context of the research. What is it we're studying? How big of an effect might matter? Um, so Cohen, you know, this is a set of his standards with Cohen's D, R, and R squared. Uh, so you can see the small right here has 0 0.01, medium 0 0.06, right? And large 0.14, right? So I kind of gave numbers approximately in line with Cohen's standards here. Your book gives slightly different numbers. Uh, so some final issues to think about, you know, really the biggest thing with these tests is understanding how we estimate the variability for each of these types of tests. For a one sample test, all you do is you use the standard deviation for the one group you have, right? You only have one sample, so you just use that one sample's standard deviation. Nothing else to go off of. For the related, you actually care about both so what we have to do is we have to get a pooled estimate right so we a pooled standard deviation is what you would use in Cohen's D most typically right and 
you would want to use the standard deviation of the differences, the different scores, right, if you're doing a related sample test. So the one sample, the independent sample, the related sample. And that corresponds to what we would have done in the t-test because, again, the t-test here, you'd have x bar minus mu over s divided by square root n for the t-test. For the independent sample t-test, you have the difference between the two sample means over what? The standard error of the mean difference, which is the pooled variance for each group, right? So square root all that. And then for the related sample test, all you have is the average difference over standard deviation of the differences divided by square root of n, where n is the number of different scores, right, or pairs. And so this same thing carries forward. Right. So the last thing we want to do is talk about how do we write up these results in APA style. And I generally give people a three sentence format. So the three sentence format that I typically use includes the first being, what did you do? That's the first sentence. The second sentence. What did you find? And the third sentence, what does it mean? So this is your job when you're going to write up a result section for a t-test. Now remember, the APA re reporting style is t, in parentheses, the degree of freedom term, equals, and then you would write the value for the t-test, so the t-value here, the actual number. So this is t. This would be the number that you got for t, comma, the p-value, right, which is whatever it equals, or if it's less than whatever, right, so equals whatever the value is, right, and then you would write the effect size, whether you chose d or r squared to report. So if we had the example for our statistics for our previous one, you would have a t we had 24 degrees of freedom in our example, equals 14, comma, p less than 0 0.001, comma, r squared, 0.89, or you could have done Cohen's d, which was 2.8. And so we would say that this was a statistically significant result, because p is far below 0 0.05, and a large effect, right? So if we were going to talk about this, first thing we'd want to do is say, what did we do? We would say, in order to determine whether a sample of students was scoring significantly better on their SATs than the state average, a one sample t-test was performed. So there I explained to you what I'm doing, right? I have this group of students. I want to see if they're doing better than the state average, and I'm going to use this test to evaluate it. Then I'm going to say what the results were. So here I'm going to report the results in APA style. I'm going to say the t-test yielded a statistically significant result, and then I'm going to write this information. Lastly, I have to interpret this because people don't know what that means, right? So hopefully in this class you're learning what that means, but you have to be the one to tell people. So you would say these results indicate that students in the class performed significantly better than expected or than the state average on the SAT. And now when you say that, you want to report the mean and standard deviation for these results. So, you know, when you say students perform significantly better, in parentheses in APA style, put the mean for the students, right? And then put the standard deviation, put it all on one line, I'm just out of space, right? Students perform significantly better than expected. And then after you say expected, you could put in the expected value, right? You could write mu, we'll put the mu in, mu equals 1050. And so this tells people that they did better and what their actual scores were. So again, that three sentence structure would sound something like, in order to determine whether a sample of students performed significantly better on the SAT than the state average, a one sample t-test was performed. The t-test yielded a statistically significant result. T of 24 degrees of freedom equals 14, comma, P less than 0 0.001, comma,
r squared equals 0.89, end of sentence. These results indicate that the students, and then in parentheses, mean equals 1120, sd equals 25, perform significantly better than expected, in parentheses, mu equals 1050, on the SAT. There's my three sentences. Now you can boil this stuff down to one sentence if you need to for a couple of your homework problems. And you would just say something like, a one sample t-test showed that students outperformed uh, expected values, and then you'd report the t result, t24, 14, right, that whole thing. So you can boil that down to one sentence if you need to, but for the write-ups like on your project, I would like to see you give me the three sentences. All right, so this covers our t-tests with emphasis on the math related to the one sample. We'll do some more practice with the math related to independent and related samples before your next homework's due. So hopefully this helps give you some sense of the content for the week. If you have questions, feel free to reach out.